Hello and welcome back to the Go Karts and Good Times YouTube channel. Today is a really exciting day because I'm finally getting some parts for the Impreza. And sure, I've already gotten parts for the car, but these are really fun mods instead of just making it reliable and doing maintenance things. <laughs> I didn't even know Mishimoto made shift knobs before I started looking for one, but it has really good reviews on Amazon, and it's the kind of shape that I thought I'd like. The beer tap shifter was a little bit short-lived, but like I said in the other video, it was kind of a joke, and I wasn't intending on using it for a long period of time anyway, so it's time to get this installed. Getting the package opened up, we have the knob itself, which is much heavier than I expected it to be and a set of adapters so that I can get it on to the shifter. Direct adapter selected, I just have to thread it into the knob before installing it. I do wanna note that this is the original shift boot, so it's not in great condition, especially after me taking it on and off multiple times, but I also have one of those coming in the mail later this week. I didn't know what to expect, Mishimoto being a company that primarily makes radiators, but it already feels pretty good in the hand. I even touched it, I could tell this was going to be a fingerprint magnet, but this doesn't bother me that much, and it'll look way better when I get the new shift boot in. The second thing I got for the car is completely different. It's this airflow sensor adapter so that I can replace the air box with a filter. Before people start running into the comments and calling me a ricer for doing a mod that will have very little effect on performance and is from what I think is the AutoZone brand, let me explain something. Even if it's a 10% gain in airflow, that'll still help out balance the exhaust that's already on the car. I also wanted to say that real cold air intakes for the car are like $300, an investment I'm not willing to make for what's minimal horsepower gains. I also wanted to say that I didn't want to mess with any of the stock air box stuff that would come with making my own out of hacked up pieces of coupler and metal. I think this is the most reasonable middle ground for trying to get a little bit more airflow without compromising reliability or hacking up what is a well-engineered stock system. That being said, this is just the adapter and I ordered a filter that'll come sometime later this week. That is all for the moment, but after school, I'll be making two trips out because some cool things finally popped up on Facebook Marketplace for me to pick up for the car. Things like the air filter, the shifter, or adding other little trinkets to the car are fairly small items, so I think you'd be happy to see what I pick up later today for the car. All that's left to do is make the trip to the first stop. Considering this is the farthest trip I've ever taken with the car, I was a little bit worried. A noise started happening, kind of like a ticking, as we were on the highway that I'd heard on and off in the past couple weeks. Now, I didn't know if my exhaust was a little bit smoky because I'd been burning a little bit of oil or if the fuel mixture was wrong, but I didn't think it could be that bad to where my engine was in serious jeopardy. But upon checking the dipstick, there's almost no oil left in the car. You'd think there would be some kind of indication, oil light come on or anything like that, but it's just out. All right, we're standing outside this speedway in the middle of nowhere. And if you know, you know. This issue makes me worry about what really is wrong with the engine and if we're going to make it to our second stop. Now we're just going to head on. Suffice to say you got enough time lapse after the first clip. Now we're going to take it up the road and see if the problem is still there. I know I'm not showing a lot of what's going on, but we're really just trying to figure things out and make sure this thing is reliable enough to get home. Just as you could have guessed, the check engine light came on. But the funny thing is it could be for a loose gas cap it could be for a clogged cap, could be for O2 sensors, or it could be for serious engine problems. But we're on the freeway, so there's much to be done about it. We are about half an hour away from our destination, and I'll update you when we get there or if something happens in the meantime. I know you can't see anything, but the good news is we made it. And I'm going to hold off to show you the wheels until I get home, or at least have a chance to stop and talk about them. Brought my scanner just in case, and now it's time to check out that engine light. Good news, the only codes I'm getting are for a loose fuel cap, a small evaporative leak. They're a little bit dirty, but this is just a sneak peek of the drag DR31 wheels I just picked up for the Impreza. I'll have to give a better look at them when I clean them off and probably throw them on the car as soon as possible. 
Both stops complete, it's now to check how much oil is still left in the engine after our nearly 70 mile trip. Good news, the car still has oil. Bad news is that the oil level has dropped significantly since last time we saw the dipstick. This leads me to no other conclusion than that this car is a serious oil burner. Hopefully when I get home, I can start doing some research and taking a look at other things to see what the real problem is. For now, we're going to find a place to eat and then try to make it home. It's officially time to grub before we make our journey home and hopefully I make it. probably barely see me but I made it home all right I have a couple of things that I also realized on the drive home with the oil the ticking noise did go away but I think it's still there by the end of the drive I barely noticed it this still means it's a problem and this still means the car burns oil but I think whatever that loud noise was either in the valve train or possibly in bottom end parts which I hope it wasn't could be gone or at least partially resolved because it has oil again I also noticed that most of the vibration was due to a driver's side rear wheel bearing. I also realized that because of what was going on, I didn't even really talk about what I was picking up at my first stop. So tomorrow, when I take everything out and take a look at it, I will fully show you around everything I got for the car. This is me closing the door on what was an eventful and successful trip, despite its difficulties. It's the next day, and last night was pretty chaotic, so hopefully I can make something out of the footage I took. Now it's time to get everything unloaded and talk about last night. As you can see, everything is finally unloaded. You also might notice official Cobb products. At the first stop, there were some shifter bushings for sale, which I picked up because they were too cheap to pass up on. And this is a mod I'll probably want to do down the line anyway. I also picked up some WeatherTech floor mats at the first stop, which are really, really expensive if you've ever had to buy them yourself. The WeatherTech floor mats were especially important because I've been driving around without a passenger floor mat since I got the car. These mats aren't especially clean, but I can at least tell they're washed out, so I'm gonna toss them in because they're gonna get dirty anyway. You can see what I mean by this floor mat only being in the car for a couple weeks. So, taking the old one out, trying not to dump a bunch of crap in the car, I can toss the new one in. Sure, they're not perfect, but they're a heck of a lot better than buying some generic ones online and having to cut them up to fit. All things considered, they were a great buy and a fraction of what it would have cost to get them new. I doubt he'll ever see this, but I want to say shout out to the guy who sold this to me because he gave me a great price. And when I was stopped at the gas station, he texted me to check in if everything was all right. So props to that guy. I think I'll give myself the pass because this car will eventually get those bushings. And at least I'm not sticker bombing it with a bunch of random crap. And just in case anyone was wondering, this car is very much not FES spec. Next, let's move on to the wheels. I've been looking for wheels since I got the car and there have really been no good options for a good price on Facebook Marketplace until these popped up. I think I was the first guy to text them and I got them for a pretty good deal. They're 17 by 7 drag DR31s in a gunmetal gray finish with a 40 offset. They have some decent hand cooked tires on them which are okay in the summer, but I don't plan to run these through the winter anyway. I've seen people run slightly larger versions of these wheels with different offset, so I'm not sure how well these will fit or if I'll need to run a spacer, but I'll have to figure that out. Now let's talk about what went down last night. I had two stops to make to pick up the parts I just showed you. One which was 45 minutes away from my house, and one that was an hour and 20 from the first stop. As I told you last night, I noticed a clinking or a ticking on the way there that had been very subtle on and off for the past day or so before that. When asking people about it, they said, oh, it's probably just lift or tick. So I assumed it was nothing. I last checked the oil besides last night about a week and a half, maybe two weeks ago, and the oil level was still fine. Keeping in mind that at the time of the gas station, it had traveled almost 500 miles on my oil change, meaning it had burned over four quarts of oil in that time. I also want to say that this was a 200 mile round trip and it burned almost two quarts of oil. Burning almost a quart every 100 miles, 
this engine has serious problems. And I know this is mostly my fault. I feel like a freaking a-hole for not checking the oil regularly enough. But the last I checked it was a week and a half ago and it was still at a reasonable level. I didn't know how it could drop that much oil in that short amount of time. So obviously letting it run that low was my fault, but this engine still has serious issues. Taking out a spark plug to get a closer look, these really don't look that bad. I expected them to be badly fouled with the amount of oil it's been burning, and these do look very well used, but they're not bad by any means. I believe at some point later today, my new lug nut should arrive, and in the meantime, I can install my new air filter. Now onto my air filter. And I don't really want to call it an intake, but I really wouldn't be wrong in describing it as that. Being the cheapest filter on Amazon, I'm really surprised at the quality. It looks decent. Now, I haven't actually taken it out of the packaging yet, but it looks good from here. Like I said, I really can't complain, especially given the price. And as you can imagine, this is going to sit right here. In the kit, they include this plastic little spacer and of course the adapter. And this isn't specifically made for my car, but the plate is big enough that if I need to, I can drill holes and get it adapted up. Now I just have to remove these four 10 mils and the other bolts holding the air box to the chest. like that the air box is taken out and as you can see there's some factory ducting here to feed air to the air box but I think I'm going to leave this in as air flows in the front of the car there's a little gap at the bottom of here that feeds through the fender and over to the area where I'm going to have my filter typically this air duct would just go into the bottom of the air box but here it's just going to be venting to the area where I'm going to have the filter there's also going to be air coming in from other areas in the engine bay and even though it's not tucked into the fender like a really serious cold air intake, it should be better than the air box. It doesn't take a rocket scientist to see that the holes on the adapter are in the wrong spots, so I'll have to remove it and build new ones. To get the best hole markings on the adapter, I'm actually going to remove this whole section and then trace it with a Sharpie. As you can see here, I just have to make sure the airflow sensor tube and the adapter openings are concentric, then I can mark away and drill my holes. With everything all marked out, it's time to start drilling. With those holes drilled out, now I can just put everything back together. like that it's installed and it looks pretty good especially with this dress up hardware i was intending to use on my motorcycle body panels but never got around to doing i was thinking about tucking the filter down there instead of having it up here more towards where it's directly being fed by the little air duct here but after all the lower down it is the closer it is to the exhaust and while heat rises i think being in this area it'll still get just enough cold air to work it sits pretty nicely over here on the air duct and these lines, but I still want to zip tie it down somewhere so that it keeps from moving around while I'm driving. And I don't like using a zip tie as a long-term solution, but if it works, it works. It doesn't have to be held in there that well, so this elastic strap will do just fine. And hopefully it doesn't melt or do anything funny where I have it. The way I have it oriented, you can barely tell. Well, this is kind of a racy mod, hopefully it'll do something good for me. Fortunately, while I was working on the air filter, some goodies came in the mail. Like I alluded to before, here's my new shift boot of questionable quality and the lug nuts I need to put on my new wheels. These all opened up, they look pretty cool and they'll match the wheels well. First, however, I think I'm going to start by getting the new shift boot installed inside the car. Step one, of course, is getting the shift knob taken off. Then, of course, is moving the shifter surround. Then getting the cigarette lighter port unplugged. As you may or may not be able to see, there's a small plastic ring that actually holds the shift boot in place. And when you undo the clips on both sides, should begin to pop out. It's a little bit tricky to do one-handed, but when you get it removed, 
should look like this. As for getting the boot off this ring, it's secured with a little bit of adhesive, so you'll just have to pull the boot off of the plastic. As you can see, when a little bit of force is applied, you can just pull the old boot right off of the plastic and the adhesive comes free. From there, the entire thing can be pulled off of this plastic ring and the new one can begin to be fit in place. Again, a little bit hard to show one-handed, but you can just see the boot gets sandwiched between the plastic piece and the shifter surround. And you, I just need to orient it in the position I want it before I can snap it together and call it a day. I know this probably isn't helpful, but after a bunch of finagling, I finally got it in there. Like I said, you just sandwich the new boot between the shifter surround and the plastic ring and pop it into place. It's pretty simple, it just takes a bit of messing around until you get it where you want. Like I said before, now it's just the inverse of taking it out, which starts with plugging the cigarette lighter back in and popping the surround into place with the new shift boot on the shifter. And then the final step of getting the shift knob installed it still really needs to be worn in to fit just right, but it already looks great. With everything else taken care of, the only thing left to do is finally get my wheels on. This is a process you've seen a hundred times before, so I'm not going to show you again, but I'll update you when I have them on or if I encounter any problems. Obviously, my first consideration when picking these was how they looked, but the fact that they're lighter too is really cool. And just like that, the new wheels are installed. And I thought they'd be much more tucked into the fenders, but they really don't look that bad. Unlike the original crappy wheels that came with the car, I am torquing these to the correct spec and inflating them to the proper tire pressure with care. I actually really like these rims and I wanna keep them in good condition. Sure, they'd probably be well suited with a one inch spacer, but for now, they actually look pretty decent. The only thing to do now is take it for a drive and then sometime later this week, get some good pictures or good video of the outside when there's actually light. Unfortunately, my rusting brakes look really crappy with these wheels, but they still look sick. And I think this is where I'm going to leave it for tonight. With the air filter, new shift boot, and the wheels installed, I made good progress today. And I've been keeping track of the oil consumption as I have to drive it to school and to work. And it is pretty bad, but as long as I keep my eye on it for now, I think it should be all right. Anyway, that's it for the night. It's a couple of days later and as you can see, I'm getting gas. And suddenly in these last couple of days, the temperatures dropped and it began to snow for the first time. Taking just a quick look around, you can already tell it looks 10 times better with the new wheels. As you can tell, the fitment's still not perfect, but it's a heck of a lot better than with the stock wheels. I also wanna add that these tires aren't exactly meant to drive in the cold or in the snow, but they've been doing great already. I also want to note that these tires compared to the old, hard, worn out winter tires that were on the original wheels are so much more grippy. I'm really surprised by how much just a little bit change in tire can do for the car's handling. Anyway, this is slightly awkward, but I just wanted to show off the car while I had it out. My glasses are super foggy, but I also want to say in the past couple days I spoke to an engine builder and with the cost of parts and the cost of labor to work on the head or rebuild the engine, I think it's worth it just to keep the engine in it now, running as long as possible, and keep looking for WRX engines, crashed cars, or anything on Facebook Marketplace or Craigslist so that I can drop one in. Even if I have to buy a whole car that's wrecked, like a WRX or something, it's cheaper than rebuilding a stock engine that's not worth the money being put into it. I still haven't edited the video, and this isn't a conclusion just yet, but at least I was able to talk to an engine builder and at least get a better feel for what I'm going to do going forward. I am going to check some forms and maybe even join one myself so that I can ask some questions and get a better feel for things. For now, that's it. Here again the next day, on my way to the junkyard to see what they have as far as engines go and to see what they have in their new inventory. The car is dirty as all heck, but it looks better than ever. Again, I just wanted to be able to show the car in plain daylight with the new wheels. And hopefully I can go out to some cool roads and start doing some filming for a cool edit to debut the car with new mods. If anything, I'll probably be closing out the video after I get it edited and see where everything lies. It's been a couple days and I believe in the last clip I talked about doing some shooting with the car and going to the junkyard. Shooting with the car, I did do and you already see it posted on the channel. And as far as the junkyard, there was nothing good in the yard for me to grab. As far as the car's health goes, I've been keeping an eye on the oil and carrying a cord around with me just in case. For now, all I can do is keep my eye on the issue and keep on the lookout for engines on Facebook Marketplace and Craigslist that I'll need in the long run.
Hopefully it doesn't give out anytime soon. Like I may have mentioned earlier, just swapping my motor for a junkyard one is much more cost effective than rebuilding a stock motor. Obviously I'll just try and be careful in the meantime and save up money for a motor swap when I eventually need one. And that just about brings me to the end of the video. My little edit I posted has gotten a lot more views than I thought, which is a great thing. Aside from my love to make the videos, it's your support that keeps me going. This is a little bit difficult to do next to a busy road where I was trying to take thumbnail pictures, but hopefully you'll stay tuned for the future of the car, for more mods to come, and hopefully an engine swap sometime in the future. And I don't want to say that I'm going to be swapping the engine anytime soon. I don't want to clickbait. I don't want to lead anyone to any wrong conclusions about that, but just know it will be coming. I know I probably say this every video, but this one was really, really all over the place. So if you made it to the end, props to you. Again, thank you for watching this crazy little adventure of mine, and hopefully you enjoyed. If you did, I'd appreciate it if you liked, commented, or even subscribed to the channel. And for now, this is me signing off.